So today's topic that we are going to start on is DC to AC converters, which are also known as inverters. So it is just the uh, reverse way of the rectifier. Rectifier converts AC to DC, whereas this is going to convert DC to AC. And there are huge number of applications of inverters. Uh, I'm sure all of you must have heard about UPS, uninterruptible power supply system, which is used for computers. Many of the computers are connected to UPS so that they don't really, you know, lose out on whatever data has been updated and it will continue to work despite there is a power supply failure from outside. So UPS generally has, if you look at the block diagram of a UPS, normally you will have AC supply from here, which is coming from the grid, which will be connected to a rectifier. And after the rectifier, generally you will have a DC bus, which is coming up here, which will be actually charging a battery. So this battery will be storing the power in case there is a power supply failure. The battery will be able to provide the power to the DC bus. So let's say this is the DC bus. And if it is an online UPS, there are two different types of U UPS which is online. So what I am drawing is an online UPS. So what we are going to have right next to this is an inverter. So this DC supply is converted into AC and even if there is any fluctuation in the AC supply here, that is not going to affect the computer which is getting the power supply from the inverter. So the computer is going to be, so let us say it is desktop or laptop, whatever. So this is going to essentially get the power supply from the inverter. So the inverter will ensure that no fluctuation in the voltage takes place. No glitches are there in the power supply. Even if there is a fault somewhere in the AC side, it will not affect the computer at all. OK, so we call this as online UPS because the inverter is always going to be there. So this is always present. It's not going to be absent at all. Whereas what we use as inverter at home, most of them will have actually if you look at it, we will have the AC supply at home and that is directly connected to our domestic loads. So we are going to have all uh, domestic loads supplied by this AC supply directly. But we will also have normally a rectifier which is actually connected from the same AC supply. This is going to be going to a rectifier. Then we will have a battery. Which is getting charged, so I'm going to have a battery here. I'm showing the battery somewhat like this. That's it. So now from here I will have the inverter. So the inverter will normally be not connected at all. It, it will not be connected to the domestic loads. And even this switch, what I'm showing here, this switch need not be closed when the power supply from the AC side is available. When the AC side power supply is not available, this switch will be closed and you will have the domestic load supplied by the battery because the battery has already been charged. So that is going to send the power to the domestic load so that you get power on an uninterrupted fashion. But only thing is when the power supply fails for probably a fraction of a second, you will see there is a small glitch that is essentially due to the fact that this switch takes some time to close and that switch will be closed only when it senses that if you sense the current here, for example, if I try to sense the current here, Rather than directly, you know, giving the switch an on signal, we will have this as current sensing. Current will be sensed here. So after sensing the current, if that is zero because the power supply has failed, only at that point you are going to have 
this switch closing. Otherwise, this switch will not close. So this is generally known as offline UPS because you are not going to have the inverter all the time in the circuit. Whereas this one, what I have shown is generally known as online UPS because all the time you are going to have the inverter function. The inverter will never be idle. Whereas here the inverter will come into picture only if the power supply fails. Okay, Many of the home inverters uh, follow this on offline UPS kind of configuration, whereas many computers, especially when you have a connect, uh, computer connected to a data center along the data center where you don't want to really lose out on any data or if it is like a life support system, for example, which is controlled by a computer or life support system is running on basically electricity. You don't want the power supply to fail at all or you don't want any glitch. So in those cases, you will use only of online UPS, whereas where the power supply can have a small glitch for a very short while, there you may be willing to use an offline UPS. And offline UPSs are generally less expensive compared to online UPS. So wherever it's not a very critical application, we may go in for an offline UPS application. So an, uh, another typical example of the application of an inverter is your induction heating and microwave ovens. You guys must have seen them definitely. Microwave oven requires a very, very high frequency supply. You cannot have it at 50 hertz. So most of the times in microwave oven and induction cooktop, whatever we have at home generally, all of them use a high frequency inverter. So this may be of the order of several kilohertz. The frequency may be of the order of several kilohertz. So what happens here is normally you are going to have the AC supply which you are giving it to microwave or the induction cooktop that is converted into DC by a rectifier. So I should have a rectifier here which converts that into DC. And after that, we are going to have this DC being converted into high frequency AC by means of a high frequency inverter. So I'm going to have a high frequency inverter here and that is going to convert this DC into AC. So what comes out is a high frequency AC. One more application you might have heard again, electronic ballast. I don't know whether you guys have heard of this name, electronic ballast for many of the tube lights. In olden days, when we used to have tube lights, we used to have a starter and we used to have a choke. All of you definitely must have seen that because it's not so old. Even about five, ten years ago, it was very much there. OK, so in the tube light, what happens is you will have actually a cathode and you will have an anode. Both of them will be there. So this is, let us say, anode, and this is going to be cathode. And you are going to have this connected to a power supply. Let us say this is the AC supply that you are connecting it to. OK, obviously you are not going to have really this circuit closed unless there is a discharge between the cathode and anode. To start the discharge, what you need is a high voltage induction in the cathode. So you need to have a very high voltage induced in the cathode. For that purpose, what we try to do is to have an inductor, which is the choke, and there will be a starter. So this is the starter, let us say. So you are going to have this circuit simultaneously. Okay. This starter, what we have is a bimetallic strip. Whatever we used to have a starter olden days, it will be a bimetallic strip. What we mean by bimetallic strip is two strips of metals are going to be put together like this. OK, obviously when the current flows through this, let us say in this direction, you are going to see that uh, these two metals are going to have different coefficients of expansion because they have two different coefficients of expansion. Previously they were together like this, they will open up. 
So after some time, what you will see is this bimetallic strip automatically opens up like this. This is going to open up like this and the other metal probably will. You know, because of expansion, they will just open up. The moment it opens up, it is as good as opening up a switch. The starter essentially does this, nothing else. So the moment it opens up, it is like L D I by D T is abruptly interrupted. L multiplied by I is abruptly interrupted. So you are going to see a high L D I by D T because of which a high voltage will be induced in the cathode. You understand? So what you are going to see is this cathode and anode are actually within our tube light. This is the tube light inside which the cathode and anode are there. So cathode is going to have a high induction of voltage because of which electrons will be emitted because it will ionize the gas which is sitting inside the tube and then there will be an emission. So the discharge will actually go from the cathode to anode. So the current is going to flow the other way around. Electron is flowing from cathode to anode. So the current will flow from anode to cathode and that is going to actually cause the discharge lighting. So what you see as light may be some of them may, may be UV and all, but the outside coating in the uh, fluorescent lamp that is going to convert UV and all into visible light. That's how you get the glow from the tube light. That is the reason why Golden days, the tube lights used to take some time for starting. The starter has to every time create a high voltage. The high voltage has to create the discharge and then only the lamp will start glowing. So these days, what we are trying to do is we use a very, very low value of inductance. We don't use large value of inductance at all. Instead, we are going to create a high frequency voltage, which means DT is going to be minimized. So because of high frequency AC, DT will be minimized. So high voltage is induced because of low value of DT. So this happens again due to high frequency AC supply. So what you are getting is only 50 Hertz. You convert that into high frequency AC supply inside a tube light, which is actually going to use an electronic ballast. Electronic ballast essentially refers to creation of high frequency AC with the help of an inverter. Got it? So this is another major application of uh, inverter. So I'm trying to tell you why inverters are so important. That is the reason why I'm telling you all these things. OK, one more major application of inverter is control of AC drives. So if you look at synchronous motor or induction motor, if you apply a variable frequency voltage, the speed will change, right? All of you must have studied induction motor and synchronous motor where we say synchronous speed is 120 F divided by P. This is what you guys must have studied as synchronous speed. So the synchronous speed is dependent upon the frequency. So because of which if I change the frequency with the help of an inverter, I'll be able to change the speed of the AC motor drive also. That is one more major application of AC. All the industrial drives nowadays are fed by inverters. And they are three phase inverters because we talk about three phase induction motor or three phase synchronous motor. OK. Last but not the least. If you look at all the renewable energy application, whether it is solar PV or wind, all of them require inverter because solar PV produces only DC. And if I want to tie it up to any of the domestic circuit or to the grid, all the appliances work on AC. All of you know all our appliances are on AC. So this DC has to be converted into AC through an inverter. And then this has to be given to the load. So again, inverters come into picture when we talk about solar P. Similarly, if I try to look at wind, what happens is if I have the wind turbine here, to the wind turbine, we will have a generator 
coupled and generators ac voltage also depends upon the speed very clearly the same relationship what we have written here 120 f by p is related if i try to write it as f equal to p n divided by 120 where n is the rotational speed of the generator right so we are going to have the frequency absolutely dependent upon what is the speed of the wind and wind is definitely going to not blow at the same speed it is going to change so if the wind speed is changing we are going to have the frequency output so this is going to be variable frequency ac what we are getting is variable frequency ac this variable frequency ac cannot be directly feeding our loads or grid or anything so it has to be converted into fixed frequency which is 50 hertz ac so for that also what we try to do is from here we use a rectifier and from the rectifier we use actually an inverter so what comes here is a dc and this is connected to an inverter which is going to deliver 50 hertz so the output is to the load or to the grid okay so all these applications will not function without an inverter so inverter is a very very essential component in all our industrial systems even domestic systems as well as power systems as a, as a rule whenever you are going to have generation from renewables you cannot work without an inverter okay so so much so for the applications of an inverter so what we will do is first of all we'll start with single phase inverters then we will slowly migrate to three phase inverter so if we are going to have a single phase inverter that means we are going to change a dc into single phase ac of required frequency so what we are going to have is this is actually dc what is available that is going to be converted into single phase ac of required magnitude and frequency both okay so how do we do do this so we can do this with either half bridge or full bridge so before we proceed to this let me also say that single phase inverters or three phase inverter they can be voltage source inverter or current source inverter very commonly whatever you see are voltage source inverters current source inverters are very very rare so the voltage source inverter essentially tells you that the input should be a dc voltage source if it is a current source inverter in that case the input will be a dc current source and that should be converted into single phase ac have you ever seen a current source any of you have you seen a voltage source yes so ha where where have you seen that voltage sources this is a voltage source what we have is the plug point is a voltage source please believe me it is a voltage source it's a 230 volts 50 hertz source so it is a voltage source depending upon what you are connecting it to it is going to yield a current okay so whatever we see normally is all a voltage source a battery is a voltage source what you see as 1.5 volt cell WSL that is all voltage source. So if I connect along with a voltage source, a large inductance, because inductance will not allow change in current. So this will actually try to supply a constant value of current. So this will be a large inductance. So along with a voltage source. if i connect a large inductance in series and then connect it to any load it will actually draw a constant current 
So this is what is a current source. Otherwise, naturally, in nature, there is no current source available. The current sources are all created by connecting an inductance in series with a battery or a voltage source. That's how you create a current source. Okay. So let us first of all try to look at what are these two configurations, half bridge and full bridge. What are these two configurations that now I'm going to take up? Okay. So let us try to take a look at half bridge first. And I'll show you a full bridge also. You guys have already studied the DC DC converter in half bridge and full bridge. They are very similar to that here also. So let me first of all draw the half bridge configuration. I'm going to have a DC. So in half bridge, what we are having is basically a capacitor which is connected in such a way that both of them are going to have, if I say this is source voltage, Vs, we are going to have this as Vs by 2. We are going to have this also as Vs by 2. I'm going to connect two capacitors which are exactly similar to each other and I'm going to have both of them charge equally, obviously, because it is connected in parallel with the voltage source. So I'm going to have plus here, minus here, plus here and minus here and this is C1. Let me call this as C2. Now let us say I have one switch here. I'm going to show the switch like this. This is a switch and I'm going to show another switch like this. Okay, now I'm going to connect these two together like this. Okay, so this is these are the two switches. Let me call this as S1. Let me call this as S2. Okay, now I'm going to connect a load here. So the load is going to be connected between these two points. So let me show a load like this. This is the load. In half bridge, instead of this, I had shown a transformer primary. And from the secondary, you will do a rectification and then take the output. That's all is the difference. Whereas this is an inverter. So what we are getting across the load should be an AC. This has to be an AC voltage. OK, so this is the half bridge inverter. Let's try to look at the working basically. So let's say I am firing S1. Let's say I want a 50 Hertz voltage. OK, so if I want a 50 Hertz voltage, I may get a 50 Hertz voltage somewhat like this. I may have a square wave for some time in the positive half cycle then negative half cycle, it will repeat itself. This is how it is going to be. And this is with respect to time. OK, so this is the positive half cycle. Obviously, if it is 50 Hertz, one cycle will be 20 millisecond. So I'm going to have 10 millisecond here and 10 millisecond here. So what I'm going to do is to give the firing signal to S1 for 10 millisecond. Then I'll withdraw the firing signal and I'll give the firing signal to S2 for 10 millisecond. This is what I'm going to do. OK, so when I do that, I'm going to have essentially this capacitor passing a current through the load and then coming back like this. Are you getting my point? So from C1 through S1 through the load. So if I may call this point as A and this point as B, the current is going from A to B. So when S1 is conducting, right? I am going to have the current path to be C1, then I'm going to have S1, then A, B, which is the load, and then it will be back to C1. This is the path. Yeah. Capacitor will discharge, but you are having continuously this voltage source connected in parallel. So it will replenish. It will not discharge completely. If you if you had not had a source, yes, it would have discharged. But because I've connected a source in parallel and I'm connecting the source so that that DC volt DC power will be converted into AC power. OK, so I'm going to have C1, S1, AB and C1 as the path. Please note A to B is the current from up to down. Now, then you are going to turn off S1 and when S2 is conducting. 
you look at this path so i'm going to have this is positive okay and i'm going to have essentially s2 conducting so from here the current will go like this current will go like this like this and it will flow through s2 and then go back to c2 so please note the current is in the opposite direction it is going from b to a so i'm going to have c2 then i'm going to have b a which is load and then s2 and then it is going to come back to c2 obviously you are converting dc into ac now because the way you are going to turn on s1 and s2 if you are going to do it alternately for 10 millisecond each you will get an ac voltage but which is a square voltage it is not a sinusoidal voltage it is a square voltage with a frequency of 50 hertz okay now what is the amplitude of this voltage this will be vs by 2 and this will be minus vs by 2 right because half the voltage is only applied across the complete load whatever is the capacitance voltage that is what is coming across the load so if i give vs as the input i'll get only vs by 2 as the peak voltage either on the positive half cycle or on the negative half cycle okay now if i try to look at what is the kind of current i am going to have if it is a resistive load i don't have any problem exactly the current will follow the voltage waveform itself so i am going to have the current exactly same as the voltage waveform there is no difference whatsoever so this green is voltage and the blue one is current if it is for r load let's say i have an rl load okay if i am going to have an rl load so let us try to draw the waveform here so the voltage will not make any difference let me just show the voltage the same way that is not going to change in any way so this is with respect to time the voltage will be again vs by 2 and minus vs by 2 now what will happen to the current that's what we have to check if i am talking about purely inductive load for example no resistance at all purely inductive i'm going to have l di by dt equal to whatever is the voltage across the inductance right so if i assume that this load is inductive so i'm going to have pure inductance sitting here in that case i'm going to have whenever i have a positive voltage i'm going to have di by dt to be positive so maybe the current should have been increasing like this okay i'm just showing it as though the current has increased now when i apply a negative voltage the current should start decreasing this is the way my current should look so i am going to have please note that the voltage has gone negative here from this point to this point if i may call this as say this is t1 this is t2 this is t3 and this is t4 okay from t1 to t2 the voltage is positive as well as current is positive so under that condition very clearly this device will be able to conduct there is no problem whereas when i look at t2 to t3 voltage is negative but current is positive so voltage is negative means this is conducting and let me draw this once again maybe i'll remove all this confusions let me draw it once again so i'm going to show it as though i have the transistor here or igbt here and i have one more igbt here when the voltage is negative i am going to have i have to show the uh, load like this i can show the load this way no problem it's the same thing whatever i had shown earlier the same thing i have shown now also and i was saying that this was a and this was b that's how it was now when the voltage is negative i am going to have this conducting this one is conducting so the current has to flow in this direction but because if this positive current 
the current has to flow in this direction, but only this device is conducting. How can the current flow that way? You understand the current cannot flow in the opposite sense. The current can flow only in this sense. It cannot flow in the opposite sense. So I need to provide a path for the current to continue to flow when the voltage and current are in opposite sense. Voltage is negative and current is positive. So if I have a diode connected here and one more diode connected here, I am connecting anti-parallel diode. These diodes are in anti-parallel as compared to the device direction. So these are generally known as either feedback diode or anti-parallel diode. We talked about this when we were talking about different types of diode, fast recovery diode, a Schottky diode and the regular rectifier diode. So this is essentially fast recovery diode because it has to work very fast as per the frequency of the inverter. So what is going to happen is the current still continues to flow in this direction because the current is flowing through an inductive load and the inductance cannot give away the current instantaneously. So if you look at this, this will be able to continue the current being flown through the load. So what is going to happen is this is the current direction. This diode, if I may call this as D2, this is S2, this is S1 and this is going to be D1. So first initially until here, that is from T1 to T2. So from T1 to T2, only S2 will conduct. Whereas from T2 to T3, I'm going to have D2 conducting. Okay. And similarly, if I try to look at uh, T, T3 to let us say T4. At that point, I am going to have this is S1, not S2. Sorry, this is S1, not S2. This is S1. T1 to T2, I'm going to have S1 conducting. T3 to T4, I'm going to have S2 conducting. And if I try to look at 0 to T1, that will be D1 conducting. If you want, we can again look at the path. When we look at S1 and uh, T1 and T2, I'm going to fire this. So I'm going to have the current flowing through S1 and finishing up the path like this. Okay. This current will still continue even after I turn off S1. So S1 is turned off here at this point. So once S1 is turned off, S1 is not going to be able to carry this current. So what carries this current now will be the current will flow like this, but it will flow through the diode like this. So this is the way it is going to flow. And when it is flowing, please note, it is flowing into the positive of the capacitor, which means the capacitor will get charged. So during this portion, C2 charges. Okay, and during this portion, C1 discharges. Like what uh, he just asked whether it is, uh, you Akshat asked whether capacitor will not discharge. So capacitor would discharge. So here C1 is going to discharge. And this is C2 discharge. Here C2 is going to discharge. Here C2 charges. Here C1 will discharge. And here C1 charges. So if you look at the current, very clearly, although it is going from positive to negative and negative to positive and so on, all four devices, that is S1, D1, S2, D2, all of them have their roles cut out, clear, okay? So as a rule in an inverter, we will never use a switch. If I, I can just specify the switch somewhat like this, I can just draw the entire circuit with some ideal switches like this. I can show it as though this is an ideal switch, this is an ideal switch, and I'm going to have the load connected like this. Very easily I can draw it like this. This is the half bridge inverter. but how I have to show each of these switches should be somewhat like this. I'm going to have a switch 
maybe a MOSFET or IGBT. Along with that, I have to have a diode in anti parallel. So this should be the complete switch configuration. The diode in anti parallel is necessary whenever I'm going to have an inductive load. If I don't have this anti parallel diode, the current will not find a path. And if there is no path for the current, LDI by DT is going to be enormously high. You are going, going to abruptly interrupt an inductive current, due to which you will have extremely large voltages induced across the devices. So your device, whatever MOSFET or IGBT will immediately blow off. It will not work properly. So you will need always. So this is like a bi-directional switch. The current can be carried in either direction. So this is a bi-directional switch. In that sense, you are going to have the current flow either in this direction or in this direction. Either direction is possible. Is this clear? Any questions on this? So you guys know why we are having a feedback diode or anti-parallel diode and it's a very, very important thing because you are never going to have a purely resistive load in real practice. You will neither have a purely inductive load, but you will always have some inductance associated with all the coils. That's the reason why you can't ignore it simply. That is the reason. OK, so this is the basic working of a half bridge inverter. I have also shown a current waveform for purely inductive load. Let us now try to look at a full bridge inverter. So in a full bridge inverter, let us say this is my source and I am going to have one switch here. Along with that, of course, I have to show a feedback diode and I'm going to have one more switch beneath this. So this is the second switch. So let me call this as S1 and let me call this as S2. Now I'm going to have two more switches here. That's why we call this as full bridge. So we are going to have two legs completely. So this is the second leg. And I'm going to have this as the fourth device. OK, so this is the complete full bridge circuit. And let me call this as S3 and this as S4. And I'm going to have the load here. So let me call this as A and this as B. And let's say this is my VDC. OK. So I can have if I say this is VDC, I can have first of all S1 and S4 on. So let us say this is my positive half cycle as far as the load is concerned. If I look at it from the load viewpoint, it is positive half cycle. So I'm going to have from VDC, the current is going to go through S1, then AB, which is load, and then it will go through S4 and come back to negative of VDC. So I'm going to have positive side of VDC to S1 to AB, which is load. So the current is going to flow in this direction. And then I'm going to have S4, then I'm going to have negative terminal of the VDC. OK, so this is going to be the path. Now I'm going to have. So you are going to have V load equal to plus VDC. Whatever is the VDC value exactly that is going to appear across the load. Now when I'm going to turn off, so S1, S4 are off. And I'm going to have S2 and S3 turned on. So this is our negative half cycle. This is going to be the negative half cycle. OK, so what is going to happen during this time is 
I'm going to have from plus of VDC. It is going to go through S3. Then I'm going to have BA, which is the load. So I'm going to say this is the current direction. So S3, BA, then S2, and then negative terminal of the VDC. Right? So the current is in the opposite sense, clearly, in the load. So if I try to look at what is V load, which I write as VAB, because I want to keep something as reference. Voltage of A with respect to B. That's what I'm seeing. So that will be minus VDC. OK. Fine. So let us try to now draw the waveform corresponding to this. I'm going to draw the waveform corresponding to this. So this is with respect to time. So let us say. First of all, I'm drawing the voltage. So this is the voltage. So it is going to repeat itself. Over every cycle. So here I'm going to have say S1 and S2 are on. So that is S1 and S4 are on plus VDC and I'm going to have minus VDC. So this is the way I'm going to have this particular uh, voltage waveform to be. If I assume that this is an RL load, obviously the current is not going to end when the voltage ends to be positive. When the half cycle ends, positive half cycle ends, the positive current will not cease to exist. It will still be there. So if I try to draw the waveform of current, probably it would have been negative somewhere and it will slowly increase and it will go like this. It will be an exponential increase, RL circuit. Right? And from here, again, it will come towards this, something like an exponential decay. So this is going to repeat itself somewhat like this. This is how the current is going to be. So I can say the current waveform, if I try to draw, this is I, whereas this is going to be voltage across the load. OK, so this is the current through the load. This is going to be the load current. So going by what uh, we said earlier, so I should be able to say that I, I should be in a position to draw the current waveform and which devices are conducting. I should be able to say. Oh, just gone up. OK, so let me try to draw how the current is going to be and which devices are going to conduct. So here the current is positive from here to here. If I may say this is zero, this is T1 and this is uh, pi or whatever omega T if I try to say or I can say T by two, Y pi. I can say T by two. This is T by two. OK, and let us say this is T3 and this is going to be T. This is T. Right. So 0 to T1, I'm having voltage as positive, but current is negative. So current is flowing in this direction. Current negative is this direction. OK, and voltage is positive. So voltage is uh, positive means I should have S1 and S4 on. But S1 and S4 cannot carry current in the opposite sense. So these two diodes are going to help D1 and D4 are going to carry the current and then take this to the positive of the battery. So when I'm looking at zero to T1, I am going to have the current flow from, let us say VDC negative to D4, then BA, then D1 and then VDC positive. So it is flowing into VDC positive. Got it? OK, so which means the battery will replenish its charge. If there is, you know, some amount of charge discharging that has happened, it is going to charge itself further. So this is essentially feeding back the energy. That's the reason those diodes are known as feedback diodes. 
they are feeding back the energy stored in the inductance. So they are known as feedback diode. So this is the way it is going to work. So I'm going to have D1 and D4 conducting here. And when voltage and current both are positive, I will have S1 and S4 conducting here. So I should say P1 to T by 2, I'm going to have S1 and S4 conducting. And if I say T by 2 to T3, right? That is going to be essentially the other two diodes conducting. That is D2 and D3 will be conducting. And if I try to look at T3 to T, I will have clearly S2 and S3 conducting. So we looked at primarily two kinds of configuration, half bridge and full bridge. So let me continue with full bridge because half bridge we had kind of discussed, but I had not drawn the waveform for full bridge completely. So let me try to show you the waveform for full bridge converter. So uh, in full bridge, we had four devices, if you may recall. So these are the two devices in one leg. And we are going to have uh, feedback diodes connected along with uh, each of the controllable devices. So we can show this feedback diode, four of them here. And uh, I had called these devices as S1 and S4 and corresponding devices, uh, diodes which had connected. This was D1 and D4. So let me call this as S3 and this is S2 and this was D2 and this was D3. So this is the way we had connected the devices and this was connected together like this and we had connected the load here and I had called this point as A and this point as B. Right? And this was the load. So we had said that we are going to have the waveform somewhat like this and we had considered a RL load because only for RL load you required a diode. Otherwise the diode is not there also it will work. There was no problem. But when we take the diode then in that case let us first of all draw these things with respect to time. So I'm going to show it as though the supply, if I call this as VDC, I'm going to have a VDC somewhat like this. This is how the VDC will be if I try to look at it with respect to time. But when we look at the firing signal corresponding to S1 and S4 given during the positive half cycle, and we are going to have S2 and S3 during the negative half cycle and so on. So this is going to be T by 2. Again, this is going to be T by 2 and we are going to have S1 and S4 being fired here and S3 and S2 fired here. Again, S1 and S4 fired here. So if I look at what is the load voltage, if I try to plot load voltage, this will be VDC and this will be minus VDC. So this is the way we are going to get the load voltage. So let me draw the load current and also the supply current. So if I try to plot this with respect to time, for T by 2, we said S1 and S4 are conducting. And if I'm going to have uh, RL load, so this load, if I replace this by R and L. So if I just replace this by R and L. So I'm going to have a resistance and inductance. OK, so this is R, this is L, and I'm going to call this as the load overall. This is what is the load. So we are going to have actually a current which is continuing from the negative side, and I may have the current actually going like this, and then it will reach some value like this. And again, I'm going to have the current continuing and I'm going to have the negative value somewhat like this. 
so this is the way i am going to see the current progressing so let us say this is i max if i may call it and this will be essentially minus i max because it will be exactly symmetrical with respect to each other so it might start from certain value and it will go up till i max and this has to be minus as i max as well so this is the way it is going to go so if i try to write the equation corresponding to positive half cycle i am going to see that this is the way the current is flowing and it will flow like this through s1 through the load and it will flow through s4 and it is going to return like this so whatever i have shown in the green arrow i am going to show this as the current which is actually rising so if i try to look at it from here until here this point this is essentially the path of the current okay so if i call this as some i positive i am going to say that this is the i positive half cycle so this is the way i positive flows okay so i should be able to write the equation somewhat like this um uh, if it is starting from zero but until it is going until i max so the applied voltage is vdc so vdc equal to ri plus l di by dt this is the equation which is actually followed by this so this particular i positive if i try to write this is what i should write as the equation corresponding to this and when i write the solution for this i should be able to write this as if i try to look at the solution i should say i of t in general during positive half cycle i should be able to write this as vdc divided by r that will be the uh, current if i had allowed this to continue for infinite amount of time but i'm not going to allow it to continue for infinite amount of time because i'm going to stop the signal that are going to s1 and s4 by t by 2 when the t by 2 ends so vdc by 2 multiplied vdc by r multiplied by 1 minus e power minus t by tau where tau is l by r that is the time constant of the load okay this is going to be the first part of the solution but it is starting from minus i max it's, it's it, it has started from minus i max so i should say plus minus i max multiplied by e power minus t by tau this is the way i have to write the solution so i can remove this plus and i can just write this minus common that's it so this is the way i have to write the solution for positive half cycle the same way i should be able to write uh the solution for the negative half cycle so for the negative half cycle i have to write it as though this is during the negative half cycle so if i had allowed it to continue to conduct for uh, you know infinite amount of duration it would have actually have minus vdc by r multiplied by 1 minus e power minus t by tau as the solution this must have been the solution because this is the uh, the steady state current minus vdc by r must have been the steady state current and it had started from plus i max so i should write plus i max multiplied by e power minus t by tau so this is the way it would have had the solution for the negative half cycle so this is going to be the solution for negative half cycle but now let us try to look at what is the kind of current that this particular uh, uh battery is going to supply so the battery would have supplied the current whenever s1 s4 or s3 s2 are conducting whenever the diodes are conducting please realize that i'm going to have if this is the direction of current and the diodes are conducting the diode that should have been conducting will be this d3 and d2 which means this would have allowed the current to flow back into the battery so it is feedback diode so what is going to happen is 
if i say this is s1 and s4 conducting during this portion we said it is d2 and d3 conducting in the last class also we wrote this whenever the diodes are conducting the voltage is negative but the current is positive so the power is actually in the reverse direction and whenever the power is in the reverse direction you are going to have vdc replenishing its power so the battery is going to get charged once again so the here it is d2 and d3 and here it is going to be s2 and s3 and here if i try to look at it this is going to be d1 and d4 so whenever the diodes are conducting the current is flowing in the opposite direction as far as the source is concerned whenever the devices are conducting the current is going in the forward direction as far as the supply is concerned so this portion of the current will be reproduced as it is as supplied current supply current whereas this portion of the current will be reproduced as though it is going in the reverse direction so i should show as though if i try to draw the supply current so the supply current if i try to draw from here to here that is d1 d4 whenever i am trying to look at it so i have to show it as though this s1 and s4 current will be produced as it is this will be reproduced as it is okay so i have to just reproduce this current as it is whereas from here to here if i try to draw the current from this portion to this portion where d2 and d3 are conducting this is essentially feeding back the current so i am going to have this current shown like this this is essentially a reverse current which is feeding back to the dc source okay so this will be the kind of current i will have and if i look at s2 and s3 again it is feeding the current directly to the load so i will have it like this so we are going to have the current somewhat like this this is how the current will be so this is where d1 and d4 are conducting and this is where we are going to have s1 and s4 conducting when there is a positive current flowing from the supply and to the load and this is d2 and d3 and here again s2 and s3 and here again d4 and d1 so this is the way i'm going to have the supply current so this black color waveform whatever i have drawn this is going to be supply side current whenever the supply is the battery is supplying the current i'm showing that as the positive current because the power flow is happening from dc side to ac side whereas whenever i am looking at the negative current we are looking at essentially battery replenishing or it is getting charged okay so this is the way we are going to have the current again i would insist if you can do the simulation using psim or something and then try to look at the current waveform that will actually bring clarity to you so please try to do the simulation using psim or lt spice or one of them and then try to see how the current waveforms look like especially for rlo okay now one thing we have to be very very careful is this is s1 and s4 are receiving pa pa uh, the pulses until here and s3 and s2 are receiving the pulses here so by chance if there is no gap between s1 and s4 completely going off and s2 and s3 taking over in that case we will have s1 and s2 similarly s3 and s4 simultaneously conducting by chance if s1 and s4 have not gone off and s2 and s3 have taken over right away then we are going to have a complete dead short circuit between this as well as between this and this kind of a condition generally is known as shoot through shoot through is a condition when two devices in the same leg are conducting and that is like a dead short circuit right across vdc so shoot through is a deadly condition it is going to create a huge amount of current 
through the supply and it is going to flow into one of the legs whichever leg is short circuited completely so shoot through refers to such a condition of the voltage source inverter where the load is not at all involved the load is absolutely not involved only one leg is short circuiting the supply directly and you are going to have a very very huge current flowing through this that will actually spoil the battery that will also spoil the two switches because huge current is going to really flow through those switches so shoot through has to be avoided completely this has to be avoided completely to avoid that generally what we do is we tend to give the signal here may be slightly less than the end of the positive half cycle and we try to give the signal to the other two supplies that is outgoing devices will be turned off only after they are turned off completely the incoming devices will be given the pulses so you have to know what is the turn off time of the outgoing device if the outgoing device takes say 20 microsecond 30 microsecond to turn off then you have to wait for those 20 30 microseconds and then only give the power uh, the pulses to the incoming devices so there is a time lag small time lag we give between the outgoing devices turning off and the incoming devices turning on and only after that we are going to give the power so we normally make sure that there is a time lag between the outgoing device and the incoming device to avoid shoot through we cannot have shoot through it is deadly for the devices as well as the battery that is the reason why we are going to have a time lag now let us try to see if i have this kind of a square wave output in the output voltage what is the kind of harmonic content i'm going to have in the output voltage so let's try to look at this so the harmonic content in the output voltage of a single phase inverter that's what we are trying to see normally we would like to have this as sinusoid so if it is not sinusoid it's a square wave what is the kind of harmonic content we are having that's what we are trying to look at so let us say this is going to be my output waveform so i'm going to have for t by 2 i'm having positive and for t by 2 i'm having negative so this is plus vdc and this is going to be minus vdc and this is the v load okay so i can write this as 0 pi and 2 pi if i am trying to look at it as omega t so we had written the fourier expansion earlier also so let me just reiterate it so let me try to write the fourier expansion for this waveform so the fourier expansion is going to be whatever is vdc so i am writing this as f of omega t for this i am writing the fourier expansion the first portion is going to be whatever is v average i will not write this as vdc because we have taken the source as vdc so v average plus sigma of n equal to 1 to infinity i have to write this as an cos n omega t plus bn sin n omega t okay so when n is 1 we call this as the fundamental fundamental component or fundamental frequency component of f of omega t and we want this to dominate because we want everything to be if we want to produce a 50 hertz waveform we want it to be purely 50 hertz sinusoid we want to avoid all the 100 hertz 150 hertz 200 hertz and so on if it is possible we would like to avoid it okay so let us try to calculate the components of this in terms of 50 hertz 100 hertz 150 hertz and so on okay so what will be the v average value v average value we will calculate it as 1 by 2 pi right from 0 to 2 pi we try to integrate f of omega t d omega t 
This is V average, right? And in this particular case, because the positive half and negative half are exactly symmetrical, we say that this waveform has F of omega t has half wave symmetry because you are going to have the positive half and negative half exactly similar to each other. So we are going to have the average value to be zero. Very clearly, positive half and negative half will cancel out with each other. So we are going to have this value to be zero. So there is no average component present in this particular waveform. That is zero. Let's try to calculate what is the value of. If we have to calculate RMS, we can calculate the RMS as basically VDC square, right? Because VDC is the value of voltage that is available that is during positive half cycle as well as negative half cycle. When we square it, minus VDC will also become VDC square. That's not a big deal. So VDC square multiplied by D omega T, right? Because whatever is the F of T whole square we will do and F of T whole square is VDC square. OK, and we are going to integrate it from 0 to 2 pi and we can average it over 2 pi and we can take the square. root. This is what is the RMS value. So the RMS value is going to be right. So we will have this to be essentially VDC multiplied by 2 pi minus 0 divided by 2 pi and square root of this. So that is going to be exactly VDC itself. So the RMS value is VDC. OK, whereas if I try to look at what is the. Fundamental component, whatever we have written AN and BN, if you may recall what we had written as AN was integral of again, if I say this is having half wave symmetry, I can just do only until pi. That is good enough. OK, so 0 to pi 2 by pi. And I'm going to say F of omega t cos n omega t d omega t. This is a n because if I'm multiplying this by cos n, I have to take cos n here too. And if I try to look at what is b n, b n will be again 2 by pi integral of 0 to pi F of omega t sin n omega t d omega t. This is how we get the Fourier coefficients. These are the Fourier coefficients. So if I want specifically only a1, I can say this is 2 by pi. F of omega t in this particular case is VDC because that is the waveform that we are having. And I have to say cos of omega t d omega t. This is the fundamental. OK, similarly, I have to write V1 equal to 2 by pi integral 0 to pi. F of omega t is going to be integral of VDC and this is going to be 0 to pi again sine omega t t omega t. OK, so now I should be able to write this as Let's see what is A1. A1 is 2 VDC divided by pi cos omega t. I'm going to have the integration as sine of omega t and I have to substitute the limits of 0 as well as pi. Right and this will be 0 clearly. So this will come out to be 0. So all the coefficients of A, especially in the fundamental, that is going to be 0. Now, if I try to look at what is B1, this will be 2 VDC by pi. And for sine, I have to write cosine of omega t. And I'm going to have the limits inverted because there is a negative sign. So I have to say pi and 0. So cos 0 minus cos pi. So that is going to be 2. So I'm going to have 4 VDC divided by pi. OK, is that clear? So I'm going to write if I try to write the fundamental component. So I should say DC component or average component of the output waveform. Is zero, whereas fundamental component. 
I have to write this as. This is going to be 4 BDC divided by pi sine omega t. This is going to be the fundamental component where omega is the frequency at which I am firing the devices. If I'm doing it at 50 Hertz, I'm going to have omega to be 2 pi f, which is 340. That is why it, that is how it is going to be. OK, so I am going to have 4 VDC by pi sine omega t as the waveform of the fundamental. So if I reiterate again, if I just draw my square wave like this, which is coming out of my inverter. If I have to draw the fundamental, how much is 4 VDC by pi? 4 VDC by pi will be 2 VDC by pi, what we get, 2 VM by pi, what we get there. That is essentially 0.9 or something like that. So I can write this as, this will be, I should write the RMS value, RMS value of the fundamental, of the fundamental wave. will be basically 4 VDC by pi divided by root 2, right? So that will be 2 root 2 by pi VDC. That is going to be the RMS value of the fundamental wave. Okay, so 2 root 2 by pi, I think comes out to be 0.9. Verify it, it will come out to be 0.9. So the RMS value is 0.9. So I will have the fundamental wave somewhat like this. It is going to be, I am not really drawing it to exact scale, but it will be slightly higher than VDC, I suppose. 4 VDC by pi will be slightly higher than VDC. So if I try to look at the fundamental wave, the fundamental wave will be somewhat like this. This is going to be slightly higher than VDC and it will end up like this. OK, so I should say this is fundamental. V fundamental, whereas this is the actual V load, which is going to have the peak value as going to be plus VDC and this is going to be minus VDC. This is how it is going to be, okay? So if I try to get now, what is the total amount of harmonic content? So if I just say, what is total harmonic distortion? This is a very, very important concept, especially in inverter because what you will say here is what is the VRMS value minus what is the fundamental RMS value whole square square root of this divided by V1 RMS. This is the total harmonic distortion that you are generally going to calculate. So THD, this is a very, very commonly used terminology in inverters, especially because you want to see out of the total RMS value you get, how much is really going to cater to the needs of fundamental? What is the rest of the unwanted stuff that is there? Okay, because you are going to get not only the fundamental, you get a square wave only, which is consisting of third harmonic, fifth harmonic, seventh harmonic, and all of them. All the even harmonics will happen to be zero because you are having half wave symmetry. That is the reason why even harmonics will be normally absent because half wave symmetry is there. You are exactly firing S1 and S4 similarly and S2 and S3 will be very similar to S1 and S4. Okay, so in this particular case, I can say VRMS is VDC. We had calculated this VDC square. Minus we have this is 2 root 2 by pi whole square times VDC square, square root of this, divided by, okay? I am going to have basically V1 RMS, which is again 2 root 2 by pi VDC. So this is essentially the total harmonic distortion. If you calculate it, it comes out to be something like 43% or 44%. 
So what this tells you is the amount of harmonic content present in this particular waveform is way too high. So I can take VDC out so I can I'll be able to calculate the uh, I mean cancel out VDC. So it will essentially come out to be 1 minus 2 root 2 by pi whole square divided by 2 root 2 by pi. Of course, square root of this. So this will be the THD. And percentage THD, I can multiply this by 100. So the harmonic content in a normal single phase inverter, square wave inverter is way too high. And that is the reason we want to go in for something like pulse width modulation control. So I'm going to slowly migrate to something called pulse width modulation or PWM. PWM is a very, very common terminology we use. For two purposes, this is used. One is if I am going to have PDC as the input, and I have the full bridge, uh, you know, the inverter. So I'm going to show this as switches simply. Each of these switches, uh, an IGBT or a MOSFET with a diode in anti parallel. Okay. So each switch is going to be maybe an IGBT or a MOSFET along with a diode in anti parallel. This is the way it is going to work. OK, now I'm going to have the load here. And if I'm going to have this one and four switched on for half the cycle and three and two switched on for half the cycle, I'm going to have essentially a waveform something like this. That's it, right? Which means if I have a fixed value of VDC, my output is also fixed. The RMS value is fixed. So V output RMS is going to be VDC in this case. So I will not have any control over the amplitude. I will not have any control over the harmonic content. Absolutely. If I want to have control over the amplitude, so this is my V0, which is having plus VDC and minus VDC as its two ends, right? The maximum is plus VDC and the minimum is minus VDC, and each of them is going to be present for T by 2 and another T by 2. I don't have any control over this. Rather than this, if let us say I decide to turn on S1 and S4 only for a short duration during the positive half cycle, I'm going to leave some portion absolutely zero voltage. I'm not going to give any pulses to anything. And similarly, I'm going to give pulses to S2 and S3 during another portion. So let us say this angle I call as alpha and this angle is also alpha. So I am essentially having this only for the duration of pi minus 2 alpha. For pi minus 2 alpha, I am going to fire S1 and S4. Similarly, for pi minus 2 alpha, I am going to fire S2 uh, and S3. So I'm essentially playing around with the width, width of the pulse. Whatever is the width of the pulse, I'm playing around with that. That will essentially reduce the amount of voltage that is being given to the output. So for a given amount of VDC, how much is the voltage I want to give to the output can be controlled by adjusting this alpha value or indirectly the pulse width value. So I am modulating the pulse width to arrive at certain value of magnitude of the output voltage. So I can achieve amplitude control or output amplitude control by controlling the value of alpha or width of the pulse. So pulse width modulation can be used first of all for amplitude control for sure. If I don't have any control over the pulse width, I give the pulse for entire T by 2. 
then I don't have any control over the output amplitude. I will get the output amplitude always to be VD. RMS value will be VD. But if I actually control this particular alpha value, I would be able to control the amount of RMS value that is being delivered ultimately to the load at the output side. So the first purpose of pulse width modulation is amplitude control. Amplitude can be controlled even for a given fixed value of DC voltage. Whenever I have a fixed value of DC voltage, if I have pulse width modulation implemented, I will be able to control the output amplitude. The second purpose of pulse width modulation is if rather than, yeah. Yeah, amplitude means I'm talking about the magnitude of the voltage that is given to the output. The magnitude is in the form of RMS. So I call the amplitude as RMS basically. We are not talking about the positive excursion or negative excursion. We are talking about what is the overall amplitude or magnitude of the voltage that I'm giving to the output. OK, the second one, what I can do is if rather than giving one single pulse, if I say that I'm going to give a large pulse in the middle, I'm going to give small pulses towards the end. I can definitely do this. OK, the same way I would be able to give small pulses near pi and I'm going to give large pulse near pi plus pi by two. So this is close to pi plus pi by two. This is close to pi by two. This is close to zero. This is close to pi. Right. So near pi, I want basically the voltage to be smaller. I want the amplitude to be I want the amplitude to be smaller and I want the amplitude to be larger here. Right. So if the amplitude is larger here, that means if I give the area under this pulse to be larger, I can say indirectly I am modulating the pulse width in such a way that wherever the peak of the sine wave should lie, I'm going to give a wider pulse. Wherever the peak, uh, the zero crossing of the sine wave is lying, I'll give a smaller pulse, shorter duration of conduction. So this is generally adjusting the pulse width in such a way that near zero, I give a narrower pulse and near the peak, I'm going to give a wider pulse. So will I be able to adjust the width of the pulse in such a way that the amplitude of the sine wave is somewhat emulated by the area under the pulse? So this is also one way of eliminating the harmonics by adjusting the amplitude or width of the pulse in such a manner that near the peak, I will have wider pulse and near the zero crossing, I will have shorter pulse. OK, so this is another important application of pulse width modulation where you may be able to do harmonic control. So these are two major applications of pulse width.